Hello, and welcome to the third installment of Looking Back to Look Forward, a four-part interview series that the Council, Carnegie Council is producing this fall to mark the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. My name is Adam Reed Brown, and I'm the editor of Ethics and International Affairs, the Council's quarterly peer-reviewed journal published by Cambridge University Press. This series builds on the work of the fall 2020 edition of Ethics and International Affairs. That issue features a special collection of nine essays on the UN at 75, organized and guest edited by Dr. Margaret P. Carnes. To explore the content in that issue, we encourage you to visit eiajournal.org. For this third episode, I'm once again honored to introduce Dr. Carnes as our host. Dr. Carnes is Professor Emerita of Political Science at the University of Dayton, and since 2015, she's been a visiting professor at the Global Governance and Human Security PhD program at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. She's published widely on UN peacekeeping, post-conflict peacebuilding, global governance, and the future of the UN system. I should also note, in addition to being the guest editor on our special issue, Dr. Carnes contributed a co-authored essay with Kirsten Hack and Jean-Pierre Murray, titled The UN at 75, Where Are the Women in the United Nations Now? And today, Dr. Carnes is joined by Dr. Noeline Heitzer to discuss this very topic, the role and position of women at the UN. Dr. Heitzer has held numerous high-level positions within the UN system, and we're delighted to have her with us here today. So with that, I'll hand things off to Dr. Carnes to get things started. Enjoy the discussion. Thank you, Adam, for that very nice introduction. It has been my pleasure to work with you in guest editing this special issue of Ethics and International Affairs on the UN at 75. And in conjunction with the inclusion of my own co-authored essay on where are the women in the UN now, to interview Dr. Noeline Heiser of Singapore. Between 1994 and 2007, Noeline was the key person at the United Nations in pushing for issues of particular concern to women as executive director of the United Nations Development Fund for Women, known as UNIFAM. And she was the first executive director from the Global South. Noeline was a central figure in the planning and execution of the Beijing Women's Conference. She broadened UNIFAM's activities with work on women's human rights and violence against women, and played a critical role in pushing the UN Security Council to adopt Resolution 1325 on women, peace, and security. In her 13 years at UNIFEM, she also laid groundwork for the larger entity that became UN Women in 2010. Noeline herself, however, went on to serve as an Undersecretary General and Executive Secretary of the Economic and Social Council of Asia Pacific, and in 2013-2014, a Special Advisor in Timor-Leste. She is currently a member of the Secretary General's High-Level Advisory Board on Mediation, not surprisingly, Dr. Heiser has also served on numerous boards and won numerous awards, including the Dog Hammarskjöld Medal in 2004, awarded by the Human Hammarskjöld Foundation in Sweden in memory and honor of the foreign, former UN Secretary General. As it turns out, we are not only celebrating the 75th anniversary of the founding of the United Nations this year, we are also marking the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Women's Conference, and the 20th anniversary of the UN Security Council's passage of Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace, and Security. And Dr. Norlene Heiser played a role in each of these three events during her time as Executive Director of UNIFEM. In proposing that I interview her for this series, I could think of no person who would be better to speak about where are the women in the UN now and what it has taken to get to this point. Thank you so much, Norlene. For agreeing thank you. To interview. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kanz. It's a joy to be with you again. And many thanks to the Carnegie Council for making this conversation possible. And thank you. My first question is as follows. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has earned high marks for setting and achieving his goal of gender parity in the UN's senior management and in improving the recruitment of women and gender balance in the UN's professional staff more generally. But as you know all too well, it has taken a very long time for the United Nations to get to this point. What in your view have been some of the principal obstacles and who and what have finally made a difference? Peggy, since we are celebrating UN 75, the best place to start is really the birth of the United Nations and the UN Charter on how best to create a new world order after the devastation of the Second World War. Now, it was a very transformational moment. 
And the UN Charter in its preamble uh, ensures, and I quote, the equal rights of men and women to promote social progress and better standards of life in larger freedom, unquote. Now it starts with we the peoples and it promises every individual in every country an equal claim to dignity, respect and happiness based on freedom from want and freedom from fear. Now these are all wonderful aspirations and norms agreed to by all member states but there have not been enough practical changes on the ground and in our institutions, and the norms remain unfulfilled promises. So what are the principal obstacles and who and what have made a difference? Let me be very blunt. Now the principal obstacles are systematic gender barriers shaped by patriarchal power with deep historical roots. It is about how power continues to be unequally distributed and how women have continued to experience patriarchal power in the institutions of member states and in the UN itself. And this has resulted in the devaluation of women's work, the concentration of women in low pay, low status employment, the erosion of women's legal rights and voices in decision-making and in multiple forms of violence. Now, what has made the largest difference? The tenacity, the courage and the legacy of women engaged in the thought and practice of transforming societies and institutions to achieve equal rights and dignity for women. Now, they have taken to the front lines of change to get women the right to vote, to decent working conditions, to quality education, to equal um, rights of citizenship. In fact, four women out of the 160 delegates in San Francisco, supported by civil society women's activism, provided the leadership to include the equal rights of women in the UN Charter. They wanted to ensure that women would no longer be undervalued undereducated, overworked, and underpaid, especially when member states were forging an inclusive rule-based order for the security of big and small nations, and countries coming out of colonialism were finding new pathways for development. Now, to address the widespread gender inequality in legal, social, and economic rights, women had to organize and mobilize to fight hard to be heard, to put their ideas of development and equality on the UN agenda, and to hold their countries accountable. In fact, the four global UN conferences on women in Mexico, Copenhagen, Nairobi, Beijing, with the theme equality, development, and peace, provided the platform for action and catalyzed change in the situation of women in country after country. Many decades of advocacy and women's leadership have resulted in the global recognition of the contribution of women to development and the cost of gender discrimination to countries and to institutions themselves. Now, the UN Secretary General is the global guardian of our shared values and shared vision as embedded in the UN Charter, with the promise to deliver a people-centered multilateral system in the four pillars of peace and security, development, human rights, and political governance. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, as a leader and as a person, understands deeply the working and intertwining of the two major historical forces of discrimination and inequality, colonialism and patriarchy, and the importance of changing power relationships. He has spoken very strongly about how gender inequality harms everyone when policies are made through the eyes of half the population and prevents us from benefiting from the experiences and intelligence of half of humanity. He has called himself a feminist and has earned high praise for major actions to achieve full gender parity and even more in the senior management and appointing women leaders to head traditionally male arenas, for example, in the Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, 
and also appointments of his special representative, the special representative of the Secretary General in difficult countries like in Afghanistan recently. His actions must also be seen uh, in the changing context when for the first time in the history of the United Nations, seven women leaders were also contesting for the top job in 2016. And many wanted to see a woman elected uh, uh, as Secretary General, including by the Women SG campaign of civil society. However, he has also faced some resistance from the traditional bastions of the UN bureaucracy and some member states that, that are opposed to women's equality and rights or are using them in the context of big power rivalry. Thank you. Thank you very much. I wonder if you can articulate a little bit for our viewers, why it matters how many women are employed in the UN's professional service and particularly in its leadership. You know, Peg, how does it is, matter outside the you, UN? You know, Peggy, this matters a lot. It is important to understand how different women leaders in the UN have brought transformation in the system through their understanding of the grounded realities of women's lives and what needed to change and their relationship with women's civil society, what I call the inside-outside relationships. Mm. Now, by its nature, the United Nations is a hierarchical intergovernmental organization where mainly male government leaders make decisions that affect the directions and functioning of the organization. But at the same time, the United Nations has a very strong history of mobilization and partnership based on the values and the moral authority of the UN Charter. Now it has opened new possibilities, created spaces and built alliances with we the peoples to bring about social change and accountability, especially with women and civil society. Now the success of women leaders in the system was actually knowing how to reclaim the convening power and the authority of the UN to mobilize the power of constituencies and knowing how to use top-down and bottom-up leadership to change the rules of the game when they did not work for women. Now, in short, women leaders in the UN have engaged civil society and governments and have the experience of cooperating to build an inclusive multilateralism from the ground up, mobilizing to establish new agendas but also new practices based on the UN Charter as we the peoples imagine the world anew. Now, let me just give you a few very concrete examples of the people whom I know and I've worked with. Mm. Helvi Sapella from mm. Finland. Now, she was the first woman, and I'm sure you know her, uh, Peggy, who hold the position of the UN Assistant Secretary General in 1972. Now, she used her position to organize the first ever World Conference on Women in 1975, when she was the Secretary General. And this opened up new spaces for dialogue with women everywhere. Now, Nafis Sadiq, a dear friend from Pakistan, a, a wonderful leader whom I admire, was appointed in 1987 as the first woman from the developing world to head an operational fund of the UN as the executive director of UNFPA. This was the Population Fund. Mm -hmm. She was instrumental in addressing the reproductive health and needs of, of women on the ground and incorporating their voices into population policies and programs internationally. When she became the Secretary General of the International Conference on Population and Development, commonly called the ICPD, she brought a whole new perspective and narrative to population and development issues. Now, both their work fed into the Fourth World Conference on Women and the Beijing Platform for Action, seen as a hand, the landmark global action plan for women's empowerment till today as we celebrate Beijing Plus 25. Now, it is important, however, not just to have women leaders in the UN system itself, but also to have women as diplomatic representatives of their member states. For example, uh, several women ambassadors were so inspired by UNIFEM's global uh, video conference highlighting the concrete work 
of the UN Trust Fund to End Violence Against Women that I started in UNIFEM, that they immediately took leadership in the 1999 UN General Assembly to establish the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. So on 17 December 1999, the General Assembly unanimously agreed that the 25th of November will be the International Day to End Violence mm. Against Women. And every year, women worldwide use the 25th of November till Human Rights Day on the 10th of December to organize for greater efforts to end violence against women. Now, another example um, is in the area of peace and security. Navi Pile from South Africa mm -hmm. made a big difference, Peggy, when she was a UN-appointed judge and president mm -hmm. of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. Now, Ravi, uh, 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 Navi understood the criminal and the politicized nature of rape in the Rwandan genocide and upheld the need for accountability. With women's organization, uh, we work together to address sexual violence against women as a weapon of genocide. Her judgment in 1998 was historic as it set precedence not only for the Rwanda tribunal, but for rape and sexual violence to be prosecuted under international law as an act of genocide. Now, maybe I could even share about my role as, a, as executive director of UNIFEM. Uh, and one of my proudest achievements was working with the Security Council and women from conflict-affected countries on the Women, Peace and Security Agenda that resulted in Security Council Resolution 1325 in um, 2000. Now, this marked the beginning of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda in the Security Council, thanks to Namibia using its presidency in such a strategic manner. Now, the Security Council um, 1325 consists of four pillars, prevention, protection, participation, peace building, and recovery. Now, it was a major mindset change and a new paradigm for peace and security because it broke the silos for the first time between human rights, development, peace and security, and addressed sexual violence as a war crime and promoted women's rights to inheritance, health, education, and employment as critical for sustaining peace and in rebuilding of society. Basically, it shifted the idea of security as military security to human security. It supported women's meaningful participation in peace and recovery to overturn underlying inequalities and to shift to a future that upholds justice, restores confidence, and transforms institutions for greater peace and security. And this year, we are indeed celebrating the 20th anniversary uh, of this um, resolution. In short, many women leaders in the UN have brought changes to policies and actions that people thought were impossible or far too radical. <laughs> so, uh, besides the examples I shared, uh, women pioneers in the United Nations have acted as change agents. Uh, and they have focused on the establishment and implementation of legal frameworks. The best one the range actually from the United Nations, from about, it was, is actually CEDAW, the United Nations Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, and the Beijing Platform for Action, as we have mentioned, Security Council 1325, but there are also the gender perspectives to the Millennium development goals and currently the sustainable development goals. Now equipped with these international frameworks, women worked with a wide variety of partners including men to advance their implementation. So it's not just about setting up these frameworks, it's actually about implementation. And they focus on the equality of voice in decision making to contribute to the development process the demanded equality in economic and social opportunities, including closing the gender wage gap. They fought for equality in law, especially related to family law and women's property and inheritance right. They worked hard to end violence against women at home and in the workplace, advocated for 
equality and better access to health, food and education, demanded social support for women's caregiving roles and investment in transport, water and energy infrastructure to reduce women's workload and time poverty. So today, many, uh, many more countries are adopting laws and policies to promote and promote women's rights, including access to decent employment. It is unfinished business, but one started by the collective action of women across institutions and borders and have created real change because they demanded implementation and accountability and they worked hard to achieve it in all its, uh, the, the different ways that we have discussed. Thank you. Thank you for that, for that rich uh, uh, narration uh, of the changes. I'm curious that the same time in which you and the staff at UNIFEM and others were working on these various issues, whether there was also a focus on trying to increase women's presence in the professional staff of the UN itself um, at various levels, including lower and middle levels so that there would be a pipeline, as we often say, uh, mm -hmm. toward uh, higher level leadership positions. Now, this is a very important uh, question, um, Peggy, because it basically, uh, try to recreate and to generate new blood in the UN system. So yes, definitely I've acted out, uh, but I, I have acted to strengthen uh, greater women's presence in the UN system. But I have to admit that I acted out of the usual bureaucratic box. Uh, since, <laughs> since, and I, I made Get use, things done. Uh, <laughs> I basically made use uh, of UNIFEM's mandate to be an innovative and a catalyst for change. And I took that very seriously. So when I was the executive director of UNIFEM, at, uh, uh, this was at a pivotal historical moment uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall when the UN opened new opportunities to connect community conversation with global dialogues, to give voice to the voiceless, to defend the, the defendless. And it provided the platform for cooperation with governments and civil society, connecting with one another to find ways to improve their societies further towards equality, development and peace, especially in the age of globalization after the Cold War. People wanted a fair globalization and an inclusive globalization. Mm -hmm. The UN itself was undergoing reforms, and I wanted to ensure that the multilateral system works for women and gave voice to the realities, insights, and strategies of women frequently ignored by the decision makers and by the multilateral system itself. So it was the opportunity to connect the aspirations of local people to the global institutions and to the international community now, to be of value, we had to show that we knew not just how to strengthen women's mobilization, which all my staff knew, but how to promote strong collaboration between the women's movement and the UN as a system and its member states to implement the commitments that were coming out of all the various UN conferences. Now, real change uh, could happen only if we could harness the full potential of the UN system on the ground. Now, this required new ways of leading and learning in order to build trust and to break through the gridlocks and turf wars that were quite common in the UN system. I therefore worked to strengthen UNIFEM as an experienced global advocate and knowledge provider, a connector of people and processes from global to local, a, a valued resource for the resident coordinator system. And this is actually a newly established system under the UN reform at that time. And I recruited UNIFEM regional program advisors who were skilled in forging a closer working relationship with the resident coordinators as we made the implementation of the paging platform for action an integral part of the United Nations Development Assistance Framework and the country strategies, which was another part of the UN reform agenda at that time. The implementation and review of these strategies was not dependent on UNIFEM. Instead, it required building a unified alliance of the different UN agencies working at country level to devise a coherent strategies 
for countries' implementation. So as our resource base grew from 10 million to over 120 million by the time I left, I established regional offices to replace single UNIFEM uh, regional advisors and recruited quality teams of highly committed and skilled women, many of whom came from the women's movement, from top universities and think tanks, and many had provided leadership during the various UN conferences and were substantively and politically very strong. I wanted to make sure that the UN now had experienced professionals who knew how to build alliances with governments and local women, supporting and empowering them to participate meaningfully in the implementation of recommendations from the UN conferences, turning government commitments into real possibilities for progress. Now, this was a very difficult process. As UNIFEM was administered by UNDP, which had frozen external recruitment while it went through reforms and downsizing. I was asked to recruit from the list of floaters <laughs> um, and, uh, and I fully rejected this uh, as it was a wrong fit and I was very, very clear about the type of team leadership and organizational capacities that I wanted to develop. But after very hard um, meetings and negotiations, the director of UNDP Human Resources agreed to an arrangement that worked for all parties. So we established specialized positions with contracts limited to UNIFEM. And this arrangement allowed me to recruit excellent women and men. And it gave me the, uh, basically um, uh, the freedom to also recruit in the various regions. It made, me, it made it possible uh, for me to attract top professionals like Joanne Sandler, who became my, my deputy, Diane Elson, who led the first progress of the world's women, an annual assessment that I established, and Anne-Marie Geertz, who, director, who, who uh, became our director for the Governance, Peace and Security Program. Several of the women I recruited provided new blood to the UN bureaucracy, and some eventually became UN um, resident coordinators as well. And of course, there are many people who helped to make uh, the UN more effective to better recruitment of the right people in the right places. But I must add that our work on the Security Council 1325 significantly increased women's leadership in the peace and security sector. In 2000, uh, when I addressed the Security Council, there was not a single woman SRSG. This is the Secretary General's special uh, representative serving in the UN system. Now, against the advice of some very senior UN colleagues, I also highlighted the need to hold the UN system itself accountable, starting with recruiting women as SRSGs to, uh, to conflict-affected countries. Today, the number of senior women leaders in peace and security within the UN system has been on a tremendous rise from SRSGs and special envoys of the Secretary General to the first female commander of a peacekeeping mission to more women in peacekeeping yeah. and even member states coming up with Security Council resolutions to promote this, as in the case of Indonesia recently. In addition, the position of the rank of an Under Secretary General on sexual violence and conflict was established in 2009, and Margot Wallström, a uh, foreign minister of Sweden was appointed as his first SRSG. But I must say that um, from my experience, uh, there was a downside because no matter how hard uh, we worked or how we grew, we were not afforded the status of other UN organizations. So this was at the, uh, the time when the UN was not as gender sensitive as it is today. Now, instead, uh, in the context of UN reform in about 2006, there was a very powerful uh, women minister from a donor country who exerted pressure on UNDP to fold UNIFEM into the organization, in, into UNDP. In the struggle to maintain our independence, which we did, we realized that there was an overall problem with the gender architecture and UNIFEM's ability to effectively fulfill its mandate in the future. This was true even though we had grown our resource base nearly tenfold. Now, many people have characterized the four entities that became UN women uh, as uh, 
tiny and fractured, but that was actually quite far from the truth. We were fragmented, but uh, not tiny. <laughs> uh, Un <laughs> Unifam grew significantly uh, every year from 1995 and brought vast, uh, the vast majority of the financial resources to the new uh, entity. Our problem was our institutional status. So our preference was a fully independent Unifem, but I knew that given the political environment and focus on UN reform, there would only be appetite to create a stronger entity for gender equality if there was a merger. So my team and I agreed that consolidation was a shorter route to a more powerful entity for women's rights, building on the strong foundations of Unifem. So along with civil society, we seized the UN reform agenda in 2006 to push for a structure that will have an undersecretary general for gender equality as the head of a joint up organization for women's rights that would also bring together the normative and the operational functions together. So today we have UN women and it is regarded as a poster child of the 2006 reform agenda with the ability to end the turf wars among gender entities and a seat at the highest level of the UN decision-making table. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you for, for telling that story of the background on the creation of UN Women. Uh, and we certainly have had two very strong uh, heads of UN Women to date um, to, to, make a, to make a strong mark in, in that respect. Uh, are there things that UN Women has undertaken that you think have been particularly helpful in forwarding the agenda that in some sense you started back in the mid 1990s? Well, I, I think that uh, in a sense, they have continued some of the work. I think the work on ending violence against women have continued. Uh, generation equality is wonderful because it is involving the new generation of, of, uh, of women leaders and, and men and young men. So it's basically engaging youth. Um, they, uh, they are very much in the forefront of looking at how can we make the COVID response um, as well as understanding the impact of, of the COVID crisis from a gender perspective. Um, uh, and they have uh, worked also very hard on uh, trying to uh, establish a greater understanding of our digital world. Uh, so basically taking on some of the major challenges in the, in the 21st century. Of course, uh, they, uh, what is wonderful now is the fact that you will have these entities that are all merged together so that they are building on the, um, the work of uh, DOOR. This is the Division for the Advancement of, of Women when it was the Secretariat of the Commission on the Status of Women. And therefore, uh, really trying to revitalize th that commission would be absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. Um, of course, with the UNIFEM's work, they, they have done, uh, we have established many of the regional offices and the ground presence and UN women have built on that. Uh, uh, INSTRO, that used to be a small uh, entity focusing on right. research and training, now it can actually flourish because research and data is so important and having the understanding of big data is absolutely critical. So I, I, I think they are, they are doing well. And they, the most important thing is that they have a seat at the highest table and they are part of the Secretary General uh, senior management. Right, right. I, I, in, I, I would ask one final question in this regard. There have been reports of pushback within the Secretariat. Um, and clearly one of the, the challenges that the Secretary General faces is the push from, from particularly developing countries in the global south uh, to ensure geographic distribution uh, in, the, in the awarding of high-level positions. Um, to what extent do you think that the, these two factors, pushback against the gender balance uh, uh, strategy that the Secretary General is pushing, uh, and this concern about geographic distribution, may make it difficult to continue to, to broaden um, the, the per percentages of, of women in the professional staff more broadly? The leadership he's done very well. Uh, but obviously the concern is across the professional staff ranks more broadly to ensure that you have that pipeline in the future. Hmm. Well, I think it, uh, you are right by saying that uh, at the leadership level, uh, it's going on 
very well, which is extremely uh, important. It's not going to be easy because um, there is, I, I heard from one of my uh, male colleagues uh, from a developing country by saying that uh, one of the problem is that they can't get the male pipeline into the system because women are occupying <laughs> these positions. And I said, yeah, thank you very much. But how many years and decades have we been pushed aside? So, so anyway, so there will be uh, the, these kind of tensions, but I think the Secretary General is very, very committed. And uh, when we have a Secretary General and, and a team that is very committed, uh, resistance is part of the process. And you, if, if we were not touching the, the, the painful spots uh, in, <laughs> of resistance, uh, we will not be making real changes. So I, I think uh, we are prepared for that. Uh, yeah. Well, I suppose then the next question is, will we succeed in having a woman secretary general the next time around? Oh, uh, I, I think the time is, is, is right. Just look at what has happened with the vice president of the uh, US. Uh, and um, I, I think uh, all these are just wonderful glass ceilings to break. I think we just have to be very careful that whilst we break the, the, the glass ceilings, we are not stuck with the sticky floors. <laughs> very good. But perhaps it might even be a woman from Singapore. Uh, oh, no, I, I doubt it. Candidate. <laughs> it's, well, it's, the, it's the time for Latin America, Peggy. Uh, well, in the Eastern Europeans feel they were passed over in 2016. So, mm -hmm. you know, that, that there will then be the geographic balance issues uh, coming around again. Thank you so much, Noeline. This has been a fascinating interview and we very much appreciate your giving your time for this. Thank you, Peggy. Lovely to be with you. Thank you, Peggy. And thank you so much, Dr. Heitzer, for joining us. This has been a conversation between our host, Dr. Margaret Carnes, and her guest, Dr. Noeline Heitzer as part of the Ethics and International Affairs series, The United Nations at 75, Looking Back to Look Forward, produced by the Carnegie Council. Once again, my name is Adam Reed Brown, and I'm the editor of the Council's journal, Ethics and International Affairs. If you haven't already, be sure to check out the first two episodes in this series, the first with David Malone on the Security Council and the legacy of the UN at 75, and the second with Maria Ivanova on the environmental efforts at the UN. In the next and final episode of this series, Dr. Carnes will speak with Bertrand Ramcharan about human rights in the United Nations. For more information about this and other council programs, please visit carnegiecouncil.org. And for more information about the council's journal, including our recent special issue on the UN at 75, visit eiajournal.org. Thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed the program. <laughs>